Good morning, everyone. Welcome to CLP Smart Energy Connect webinar series. Today, we're going to present Smart City Essentials Harvesting IoT and the Cloud. This will be the third series uh, of our webinar. My name is Di Lu. Uh, I'm the head of technology from uh, CLP Innovation. I uh, actually spent my past 10 years of career uh, in cloud computing and also information technology. So I joined CLP three years ago. Uh, helping CLP and also CLP's clients to build a uh, smart energy platform that can help our customer uh, to achieve their sustainability goals. And today we're very lucky to invite uh, Benson Kwang from AWS. Thank you, Dee. Thanks for having me today. Super excited today. Uh, can you yeah, introduce a little bit more about yourself? Yes, yeah, thank you, Dee. So actually, I'm the solutions architect uh, at AWS based out of the Hong Kong office. I'm passionate about helping customers to build infrastructure and applications uh, in cloud and scale. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Benson. The reason why we invite somebody from AWS is uh, because, you know, today the advancement of cloud computing has facilitated uh, the prosperity of uh, scalable IoT solutions. Um, now, from smart meters also to rather abstract uh, smart city initiatives, all the devices and they're now able to connect to the cloud, tapping into almost you know, infinite uh, computing power. And also you can leverage the services and applications that are not available before, but now we can actually connect. So now the challenge is how to design and deliver the customer centric product that are competitive in the market. So in this, this webinar, uh, me and Benson, we're gonna talk about um, some of the uh, AWS uh, cloud technologies and also IoT services that are available for uh, the users. And also we're gonna share some of the case studies that, uh, from CLP SEC and also from some of the um, AWS clients. Yes. Uh, so without further ado, uh, also we will have the um, Q&A session at the end so you can ask questions through the uh, Zoom channel. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Benson to talk about uh, Give us an introduction about AWS IoT. Okay, yep. Thank you very much for the brief introduction, Dee. And I'm super, super excited to be here to actually uh, have a walkthrough of some of the latest AWS IoT service and how those kind of services allow a customer to transform their business. Well, um, actually, people are talking a lot about IoT nowadays, and it's it ha IoT has become a buzzword uh, for today's, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it actually presents some new and interesting requirements for our customers. And first, like um, uh, some of our customers, they are not only just deploying the IoT devices to the field site, like the factory or the building, but actually, they would like to prefer the IoT devices also interact with the backend cloud service or some third-party application systems, or they would like to have the full visibility of the IoT device so that they can uh, connect the software with the IoT device, or even send some alert or uh, send some action items so that the IoT can uh, react upon some status change. So that means that uh, we'll, it will in turn require some bi-directional event-driven communication or methodology so that you can allow the IoT devices to interact with your backend systems. And secondly, mm -hmm. uh, we know that with the prol a proliferation of IoT devices everywhere, we're not only just talking about a few or hundred, or a few hundred uh, number of the IoT devices, but we are typically talking about hundreds of thousands or even millions of IoT devices. Mm -hmm. So that means uh, you are managing a lot of devices and how do you ensure that communications is effective enough and also make sure the data can uh, can be delivered to the backend system securely and reliably. That typically involves a very different protocol, different than uh, a different protocol than the HTTP uh, we are most familiar with, which is the MQTT, message queuing uh, telemetry transport protocols. That is a lightweight protocol protocols. And third is the uh, we need to consider about the large volume of uh, connection and messages because with the growing number of IoT devices in place in the field size, you how do you ensure that the connections, so, so large number of connections are secure and also reliable enough. We also need to take that into consideration. Well, um, also, uh, during our conversation with our customers, we see that the typical IoT application architecture 
is some somehow similar to this one that you are looking at. So typically they have on the top side, they have some 30 uh, th third party application lines, the dashboards, the web application, the database, or even the iOS or Android application that they require the IoT uh, device to interact with. And in the front side, they have a, a slew uh, or a fleet of IoT devices. And typically the hardest part to manage or scale uh, is the message broker, or it could be the gateway. While uh, these two uh, different components take the road of authentication, uh, authenticating the connection and also uh, kind of act as a bridge uh, between the backend system and the front side IoT devices. So you can see that actually um, this type of architecture presents quite a lot of uh, architectural challenges for our customer to adapt to. The very first one could be the scalability, meaning that as you, have, uh, as you manage more and more IoT devices, how do you ensure the scalability? Uh, or how, how could you adapt to this, uh, uh, the scaling number of the IoT device, ensure the connection is robust enough uh, for you. And secondly, uh, you also need to uh, think about uh, the human method of maintaining operating such a large scale operating, uh, uh, large scale IoT systems. Um, let, let me give you an example. For example, you would like to scale the gateway or message broker, that would involve a lot of um, time and effort in the procurement and also setting up things. And also you also need to think about how do you do uh, uh, up-to-date patch on all those hardware devices as well. And third is the application. Typically, as you can see, the architecture is a very typical monolithic application. So that means if you would like to scale them or if you like to change one of the components, actually you also need to consider the other component which has dependency on that component as well. Mm -hmm. So it makes it very complex and complicated to scale up. And third is, uh, and fourth is the data. Uh, as you ingest the data onto the platform, uh, typically in that single architectural uh, monolithic uh, type of application architecture, you find or some of our customer find it very difficult um, to um, draw that data into other th uh, third party system or there's a lack of other third party tool for them to utilize that data and draw some useful insight for them. And finally, is the integration. And we know that um, now um, the overall IT systems uh, landscape is getting more and more uh, complex and they typically need to uh, integrate with some other third party or legacy systems. So how, how can they easily integrate those systems into the IoT system? It's very, uh, a big, uh, it's very typical big challenges for them as well. So with that, uh, with those, all those uh, challenges in place, some of our customer, uh, they are beginning to look into the cloud world because um, uh, some of the benefits provided by cloud will enable, to, will enable them to effectively address those challenges that we just talked about. So like, uh, let me give you some example, like on cloud, uh, customer just adopt pay as you go. They don't need to, ru they don't need to worry about over provision or under provision of their IoT architectures or hardwares because um, in the cloud world, we just charge uh, based on what they use or what, how much they consume, right? And also they can easily scale the architecture. So you can see that there are a lot of different uh, IoT components for them to use. They, they don't need to set, set them up manually. They just, they just need to use it and enable some of the features. It, it can easily scale uh, based on the growing number of IoT devices. So in this architecture, you can see that uh, on the left hand side, they, they place some of the endpoints or IoT device uh, on the field side, be it a factory or farm or building, and they connect those via uh, maybe a, a, third, a, a gateway. And actually, we have this type of service called AWS Greengrass, which I will talk a little bit more about that in the later slide, uh, which help them to do the protocol conversion or help them to proxy, to come, uh, proxy the traffic from the field side to the backend uh, AWS cloud service. And back onto the AWS cloud service platform. So actually, we provided uh, a slew of different fe features for our customer, including how do you authenticate a connection back to the cloud service. And also, uh, once you've got IoT devices on board, how do you effectively manage those IoT devices? And also, how do you leverage the data? How do you um, uh, do some uh, quicker uh, analytics workload on those um, AWS platform as well? Well. Um, Given that we have so many IoT, IoT devices, so actually we typically cat categorize those IoT devices into three categories. The first one from the bottom to the top is the device software. So meaning that how do you ensure that your devices can quickly connect to the cloud platform? And in the middle is the connectivity and control services. So that means 
um, how, do you how do you ensure the security and reliability while connecting all those devices onto the cloud platform? And how do you manage all those devices once they are on board onto cloud platform? And third is uh, about the data, right? Uh, we are not only just deploying the IoT device for the sake of just operating it. Uh, actually, the ultimate goal should be how do you draw business value, tangible business value from all those IoT devices that you get from the IoT devices. So in the following slides, I will go through one by one some um, to introduce some of the uh, mostly common use IoT service provided by our platform. Well, uh, when we're talking about deploying an IoT uh, platform, the very first step that we need to consider is how do you ensure that your device can connect to the cloud, right? Well, let's uh, take a back, uh, take a step back to look uh, take a look at um, some of those uh, common types of IoT device. Well, they could be categorized into two types. The first one is the microcontroller, so be it a light, just a very small light bulb, or uh, some alarms, or some lock on the door, or some doorbells, or a cleaning machine. They could be IoT device, and they could have some uh, snippets or firmware embedded into the the devices and it could easily connect to the cloud, right? Second type is uh, what we call the microprocessors. So that this involves a little bit more powerful um, gadgets embedded onto the device itself, so like the smart camera, right? Uh, they could uh, there could be a MCU embedded onto the devices, or it could be a signal generator, or it could be just a, a screen um, monitoring the uh, monitoring something onto the field side, something like that. Well, so what are the ways for us to ensure that a customer or your devices can securely, reliably connect with the AWS IoT uh, service? There could be uh, two ways, two possible uh, common way. The very first one or the ideal way is that um, your supply, your hardware supplies, actually, if they have got um, a, 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 what we call a free RTOS, so it's a lightweight uh, operating system for the IoT devices. Mm -hmm. If they've already got those iOS uh, embedded onto the device, that would be good because it can natively connect back to the AWS IoT platform. Or without without a free RTOS, so actually they could also maybe uh, install or import uh, import the SDK provided by AWS. So those uh, SDKs uh, will allow you to work natively with our backend IoT services. It supports a number of different programming language, including Java, Node.js, Python, uh, C, etc. Right. Uh, second, and a second type of connection uh, or device type of devices could be some of a customer may concern that hey, I I'm running some of the legacy IoT devices. I, I find it very I find it struggling or very challenging to connect them to the back uh, backend cloud service. In that scenario, you may consider uh, leveraging our AWS IoT Green Grass, which acts as a gateway, as a bridge um, to help you to do the legacy pro uh, IoT protocol conversion so that it can uh, use, uh, you can convert the legacy protocol or other third party types of IoT uh, communication protocols back to the MQTT and it will continue on effective communications with our backend AWS IoT service. Well, having gone through the first step of, about ensuring your IoT devices can connect with our backend system, so second step you need to uh, you you may consider is that how do you extend the cloud capabilities to the edge? For that, uh, we provided um, the IoT Green Grass, which is uh, which extends AWS Service capabilities onto your device on the edge, so that you can uh, you mm -hmm. can um, do some real time or low latency workloads, and also leverage some of the cloud native service onto the. Uh, the edge devices. So actually this kind of service solve three major challenges. The very first one, what we call is the law of physics. Uh, this applicable for scenario where our customer has very poor connections, like, um, and, and they also require to run some low latency. So for example, whenever there is a status or alarm trigger by the IoT device, uh, by, a, by a third party or by the conditions, so they would like to the IoT devices to react, or react on that kind of uh, state of change. Well, in this type of scenario, it requires very low latency reaction. So instead of uh, transmitting the data back to the cloud and receive the action uh, or the call from the cloud, so actually they would extend um, the capability to the edge by IoT green grass. Second scenario is the uh, second challenge to solve is the lot of economics. So in some scenario, like we have once uh, uh, once up. Uh, we have some customer, they would like to run some smart camera on the site and they would like to transfer 
the original was planning to transfer the image back to the cloud for some machine learning, but it, it turns out that cost would be very expensive because uh, given the large number of image that they need to transfer back to the cloud. So in that case, they used IoT Greengrass so that um, ac actually they deploy a machine learning model uh, at the edge and whenever some uh, Im image sent into this gateway, so actually it would trigger the machine learning inference so that it can give out uh, maybe a detection or maybe a, a recognition, something like that. And finally, it's a lot of LAN and that are, that's applicable for some of our customer if they have very stringent requirements on the data locality or uh, sovereignty. Um, let me give you an example. So some, um, we have some customer with a hospital and they will require that the data remain on the site instead of sending back to the cloud in that sense. Uh, they might consider using a uh, it was iot green grass so, so that they can actually keep the data running at the edge side and actually by the way hey d uh talking talking about iot green grass i heard that your team is recently actually doing some funny stuff on this kind of feature i really uh, i'm quite curious how how your team is doing that and could you share a little bit uh with me on that sure uh actually i'm quite excited about hearing uh, iot green grass yes. uh, we actually are trying this in our lab in some of the use cases and also we are uh, testing this technology in some of our uh, testing sites yes um i will use one of the service called smart office as an example uh give you a brief introduction on, about smart office and imagine uh now in office, we actually deploy certain sensors such as submitters to monitor your energy consumption, uh, motion sensor, and also air quality sensor to monitor the people movement and also the ambient um, uh, temperature and humidity of the office. Uh, and also we can install certain controller like the light controller to control the lighting and also the air conditioning of the office. So very basic setup. And then uh, we can send this data to the cloud so that Basing on the people, how many people in the office, basing on the temperature, the humidity, you can either turn on or turn off uh, the office to either save power or to make people more comfortable. Uh, at the same time, because you can monitor the energy consumption so that uh, you can know which part actually consume a lot of data, so you can uh, inject uh, more strategies to save data. Mm -hmm. So all those are to be uh, done in the cloud side. Whether, so the, the, the question is, like you mentioned before, how to send this data to the yeah. cloud because all those uh, stuff are installed physically in the office. So if you look at the design, the, the back end design is something like this, it's quite complex. Well, you can just ignore uh, the very complicated part uh, in the cloud. Just imagine this is some uh, cloud-based smart office application that you can see uh, from your web browser, from a cell phone. So let's focus in on how to connect to the cloud. As you can see, there are option A and option B. Mm. Traditionally, we actually adopting option A. So simply we uh, use a router placing on the, uh, the client office. It can be a 3G router that you can insert a 3G SIM card to connect to the internet. Or uh, we can, if your office have internet connection, we can just you know, plug it into your ethernet port and then connect to the internet. And then we leverage this router to establish a VPN connection, a, a virtual private network, a, a secure channel to the cloud. So that in the cloud, you can use the uh, vendor provided SDK to interact with IoT. Mm -hmm. So there are several drawbacks of this setup. As you can see, one is that because the router normally they only support Ethernet port, mm -hmm. means the IoT devices must be compatible with Modbus TCP, otherwise yes. it won't be able to connect. Yep. Secondly, because it relies on VPN connection. So if the internet is broken or the, in, the VPN service is broken, then mm -hmm. we will lose the connection to the cloud. Mm -hmm. You will lose all the data and then you cannot control mm -hmm. the devices on the edge anymore. Mm -hmm. That's why now we're gradually moving to option B, mm -hmm. uh, which is the, you know, the, 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 the blue part, the newer setup, where we can place an edge server mm -hmm. um, at a client site. Uh, since it's a server, um, you know, it's actually not as big as uh, your, your laptop, but actually it's as, as small as a cell phone. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, it's much, much smaller than the router itself. Mm -hmm. So with the capability of a server, then you can install a proper operating system on it, like uh, we're actually using Ubuntu, yes. which is compatible for most of the services offered by um, the cloud. Mm -hmm. um, and also, you can, uh, because as a server, you can add in so many different modules, hardware modules. Mm -hmm. So you can communicate to the IoT sensor, not only through uh, Ethernet, but also through uh, even the Modbus protocol or through uh, Wi-Fi, through Zigbee, um, mm -hmm. through uh, Bluetooth. So all kinds of communication that you can expand your capability uh, with mm -hmm. uh, the communication with the IoT devices. 
And on the, on the other hand, when we come to the connection to the cloud, you can still go the old, old fashioned way, install a 3G uh, dongle to the server so that it can leverage the 3G network to the internet. Or uh, you can leverage the um, existing uh, internet, uh, internet office as service by the office to connect to the cloud. And then um, as Spencer mentioned, with the benefit of a proper operating system, you can actually install cloud native services such as Green Glass, mm -hmm. which is the extension of your cloud computing power to your edge set, mm -hmm. where you can install a database, you can you know, run Lambda functions, and also what's be more beautifully, you can natively uh, leverage mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the nice services offered by AWS IoT, such as over the air updates, yes. uh, device shadowing, and the rules, and also uh, messaging. Uh, well, I will uh, hand over back to Benson to talk about what can you do with um, AWS Green Grass. Well, thank you very much for the great sharing. It's pretty uh, impressive use case about AWS IoT Green Grass. And uh, yeah, uh, we uh, as above, we uh, sh we go through the, sec uh, the second step of extending the cloud capabilities onto cloud, uh, onto the edge gateways. But next, you really, you really think to uh, think, you really need to think about how you can securely connect your IoT device back to the AWS cloud platform. With that, um, we have the service, what we call the AWS IoT call. And actually, this is a fully managed uh, service that lets connected devices easily and securely interact with your cloud application and other devices. And to start with, um, it first will securely connect your IoT devices. Actually, the IoT core uh, within, within which there's a message broker components which require uh, all the IoT devices will, uh, before they can connect it back to the backend system, uh, will present a client. It required the IoT device present an IoT client uh, uh, certificate so that it could uh, identify itself before it could, uh, it, it could be allowed uh, for the connection. And also uh, within the, uh, actually uh, attached to the um, client certificates is also there's a, a role-based, uh, uh, kind of like a role-based access uh, permission policies uh, stipulated into the certificate controlling, hey, once this IoT device is connected to the IoT platform, what kind of action can it do, right? So it's, it's kind of like an, a, a, a gatekeeper effective controlling the security uh, for the first step. And secondly, after you get IoT devices connected to the cloud platforms, you really need to think about, am I also absorbing all the data generated by the IoT devices? Sometimes, more often than not, our customer prefer not absorbing all the data generated by the IoT devices. So probably they, would, uh, they could create some rules uh, within the IoT core so that they can do some um, simple filtering to control what kind of data I, I really need uh, to backend flow into my backend system. And third is, uh, how do you interact with your IoT device? Sometimes in IoT core, um, our customers will prefer um, some of the features like the IoT shadow, uh, which keep track of the IoT's last uh, updated status. So whenever there's a new uh, state of changes occurring onto the IoT devices, actually relying on the IoT shadow will um, will allow the backend application system to change the to change the IoT device to the desired desired state that it it, it prefer. And finally, of course. Um, uh, uh, backend in the cloud platform, it provides a lot of different um, integration features. For example, if you would prefer to store the data in another database, of course, uh, AWS IoT Core will act as a bridge for you to integrate with the backend. Uh, for example, uh, the NoSQL database for you to store the data, the data there. And um, as you get all the IoT devices connected, uh, connected, and you are begin beginning to collect some useful data you prefer to the backend uh, cloud platform, now you really think about um, how do you manage all those IoT devices because uh, the number of IoT devices get growing. Um, our customer uh, find it quite um, at the beginning. They find it very challenging for them to effectively manage all, all those IoT uh, services. Not to mention doing some inventory or searching or querying or even like applying some OTA updates onto IoT devices. With that uh, challenges, we introduce uh, AWS IoT Device Management, which helps uh, our customer effectively register their IoT devices and also onboard the IoT device onto the platform. And after that, they were, uh, we will provide some features to allowing our customers to remotely manage our, uh, their growing fleet of connected devices. Let me elaborate um, uh, some of the uh, useful feature in this co component. 
uh, the first, the very first step for you is to uh, how how can you fast device uh, how can you perform a, uh, a, a effective onboarding IoT device onboarding onto the cloud platform. So we provide a fast device registration at scale capability, so that instead of you onboard the IoT device one by one, so actually you can do it by batch. And secondly, as they on uh, get onboarded, uh, I'm not sure if you have this kind of challenges. You find it some sometimes find it very hard or difficult to uh, do the indexing or grouping onto the IoT devices, but with that, uh, with IoT device management, you can easily do that to group your IoT devices based on your BU, maybe a business unit or departments or even factory size, et cetera. It really depends on how you would like to uh, group them into different uh, category. And also, um, IoT devices manage, uh, also, uh, management also provides capability for you to apply OTA updates onto the IoT devices. And of course, uh, that saved you a lot of time instead of doing one by one as well. And finally, in some scenario, um, let's say if you have some IoT devices sitting or residing onto a remote site and, and, and they, there are some issues occurring onto IoT devices and you really want to do some quick um, uh, troubleshooting on, the, on those IoT devices. In that sense, um, IoT device manager provides um, a secure tunnel features which allow you to remotely connect onto uh, your backend IoT devices for some troubleshooting instead of sending some people uh, to go on site to uh, look into the IoT devices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and next, we need, um, as you are managing your IoT devices effectively, you begin to uh, think about the security side of things. And, we do also have a, a useful feature it's called IoT Device Defender to safeguard the security of your IoT devices. Because uh, a lot of customers ask us, how, how can we secure all those IoT devices as they are sitting in the remote sites? And like the, I believe that in uh, utility industry, there are a lot of security compliance that you need to follow along, right? Yes. Yeah, so uh, you might consider um, uh, some of customers in that this kind of industry might consider using uh, IoT device Defi defender, which allows mm -hmm. them to set a, an audit or a security guardrail just to uh, um, quickly detect any uh, security best practice deviation on the side uh, on the IoT uh, devices. So they can easily set up some rules. So for example, if there is any client certificate of the IoT device has already uh, expired and it will send an alert to the customers and also provide some suggested action so that they can follow along to further mitigate this, uh, uh, the, the risk uh, in, uh, uh, real, uh, in time for them. And finally, and yeah, finally it's about uh, the data. So actually this topic is also a very interesting, interesting one to, uh, to be very frank. We, to be very frank, we typically start our conversation with our customer with two questions. The very first question is, how do you know, uh, how do you know the status of your IoT devices? Mm -hmm. And following, uh, follow along that question, we typically ask, if you know the status of your IoT devices, what are you going to do with that data you generated from the IoT device? So that is um, that that gives an impl impl implication of what kind of things our customer or what business goals our customer can achieve by uh, manipulating manipulating or processing a large number of IoT data generated from the IoT devices. So for that, we provide Adris IoT Analytics, which is a service that process, enriches, stores, or analyze and visualize the IoT data for our customers. Well, uh, actually with the IoT Analytics, you can quickly um, collect uh, the data that you really want and because you can easily set up some filter topic filtering so that you can filter all those data onto your destination and with that uh, further actually you can uh, set up some you can define the store that you would like to store the data into uh, for example you can leverage the aws manage um, data store in the aws iot analytics for quickly storing the data or you could choose to store those data back to uh, the s3 bucket uh, to build a data lake. And, and then you can set up some SQL query for you to process or massage the data so that you can further analyze that data. And finally, uh, is the visualizations, right? And how do, you, uh, how do you visualize the data? Because the data is so, so much data there and it's really hard to uh, just directly look into it and draw some uh, business insight from that. So visualization is a very important part of that as well. And, AWS IoT Analytics definitely facilitate that features for our customer in that sense. 
Well, um, having talked uh, so, so many about AWS IoT, uh, different IoT services, so actually it's more important for uh, maybe for you to understand uh, some of the common practices that we observe from our customer, how they leverage all those IoT devices and what kind of business value it could bring to our customers. And here, I would like to share um, one very common practice um, adopted by our customer, uh, which is uh, to build, uh, to form an industrial data lake. So industrial data lake um, refers to a central repository with which you can uh, draw the, uh, you can store the data and, and draw the data from there and also to do some uh, further analytics or visualization so that you can draw some business insight in real, uh, in real time. And data lake definitely serves this purpose for our customers and typically involves different stage um, before you can form an effective industrial data lake. So to start with, uh, you typically need to uh, consider ingesting the data and be it, be it as a real-time streaming data or any uh, one-off data ingesting. So we provide different kinds of service on the cloud for, uh, for data ingestion. And secondly, you, uh, as the data coming in, you really need to think about how you are going to store that and how do you form a data lake instead of, uh, instead of uh, having data silos. And on cloud platform, like uh, depending on the nature of the data, you can store you know, S3 bucket if it's uh, just uh, some of flat files or if you stream uh, uh, real streaming data, or you could consider using some um, database on uh, database service on a cloud to store some like uh, no SQL uh, type, of, uh, type of data or even other type of uh, database as well. And with that, uh, with the data in place in the in the data lake, so actually you can leverage our other analytic tools like the, uh, Athena, which allow you to do some uh, ad hoc query, uh, SQL. It allows you to write some very uh, easy understood, easily understood SQL language to create the data on the fly as well. And finally, is to, is to you can integrate uh, other uh, cloud service to consume the data. So for example, uh, you could build an application on the uh, on the on the data uh, on, on the cloud to consume the data and also provide the access to other internal or external uh, users as well. Well, uh, probably a, um, a picture is worth a thousand words instead of talking so many different technology uh, technology or technical jargons. So this uh, high level architecture gives you a much better sense like. Uh, at the bottom, you're collecting data from your on-premise uh, IoT devices or gateways, via, uh, which generates SCADA-based uh, uh, IoT data or historian data as well. Or you have some other IoT device providing real-time data stream as well. So you ingest them into the uh, centralized, uh, centralized repository, uh, the data lake on AWS, and then you can leverage other analytics tool for you to do massaging and manipulation on the data. And another advanced use case is the machine learning, um, uh, which you can leverage the data and also kind of uh, use the rich data sets to train some machine learning model so that you can do some forecasting, et cetera. And um, yeah. Below this architecture give you a, a more concrete of um, the use case here. So actually uh, the data lake could be applicable to a lot of different use cases. It could be used in the product quality improvement process or it could be used in a predictive maintenance. So like one of our customers actually they place IoT device into their on-site machines, the paper uh, manufacturing machine so that the IoT device can keep monitor the status of the uh, the environment and uh, also the, the the machine itself, like the the vibration level, the temperature, something like that, so that whenever there's a significant change in the status, actually they can re react fast based on that status. So how 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 uh, how do they achieve that? So uh, to simply simply put, so actually on the left hand side they have some on site uh, IoT devices, and actually all those data will go through the um, a gateway that you place on site. Uh, it could be it could be installing some uh, our service like the I IoT green grass, uh, like what I mentioned. They could do the protocol conversion or even uh, place some cloud capabilities onto this gateway as well. And then they will connect through the AWS IoT call. The AWS IoT call will uh, do the authentication and then ingest the data there. Um, customer can filter whatever data they need. And then they um, they can store the data onto the data lake on AWS, which could be uh, typically could be the S3 bucket. Then and they leverage the other third-party analytics service like Amazon, Athena, 
to do the SQL query on the fly, or they could train the data further so that they can deploy the they can deploy the ML or machine learning model, and they could do some advanced use case like uh, prediction, uh, maintenance prediction, or forecasting, um, etc. And wow. Talking so much about um, uh, how how they can uh, build the data lake, uh, why don't I just uh, maybe um, let uh, D to talk about your use case? And I believe that you guys you guys actually do a lot of work on the data analytics side and really generating some uh, business value for your customer, right? Uh, sure. Yes. Uh, when you talk about the data lake and also how we leverage IoT data, um, yes. we're actually doing almost exact the same as you just introduced. Yes. I will give you um, some example uh, about some of the use cases what we're doing now. Uh, for example, we have this app called Smart Building. Mm -hmm. uh, so we actually can install smart sensors like sub metering and all kinds of sensors on our platform mm -hmm. to your building and so we can collect data and know more about the building and or simply we just tap into your existing uh, building management system mm -hmm. to collect thousands of data points and just to know more about the building yes. so with previous introduced technology, you can actually streaming all those data mm -hmm. from the edge side to the cloud. Mm -hmm. Now all those data sitting on the cloud, mm -hmm. we can do a lot of um, interesting things like value adding services to those data. Mm -hmm. Like um, for the traditional uh, BI or business intelligence report, we can visualize them. Mm -hmm. And also uh, we can do some machine learning so that we know more about the usage patterns. So we can do forecasting on the energy consumption mm -hmm. or focusing on your solar panel generation. Mm -hmm. And also, I, I believe you mentioned the prediction maintenance. Mm -hmm. uh, so we can know all the telemetries of your HVAC system or your, of your heating system so that before the equipment cracks down, we can actually um, uh, send the notification to the facility manager so they can go there and check. Yes. And of course, all those can be automated and, and also we can send a customized report mm -hmm. to the relevant people. Uh, so the backend architecture uh, is actually um, very similar to what you introduced. We actually leverage a lot of the cloud native services offered by AWS. So there are major four areas, ingestion, transformation, storage, and delivery. Yes. So for the very fast moving data, for those like um, IoT streaming data, mm -hmm. uh, we normally leverage in services like Kinesis or mm -hmm. manage streaming for Kafka. Yes. Uh, why we need those kind of uh, soft, sort of message queue services? Because mm -hmm. imagine um, you, there are hundred people throwing tennis ball at you, and you want to catch them all at once. So you need some really powerful mm -hmm. queue to actually capture mm -hmm. all this data. Do, do not want to lose them. Yes. But for the traditional, more the traditional ETL, the tra the extract transform load mm -hmm. jobs, and you can use the S3 bucket, you know, mm -hmm. to receive all those big files mm -hmm. and then store for later processing. Yeah. So for the processing, um, normally we call transform. Yes. You can, for the lightweight, you can use Lambda function or uh, you can use container run on Kubernetes mm -hmm. to do the long-standing uh, processing mm -hmm. or for even the, the, the so-called big data. So the, sign, the data scientists are more familiar with the Hadoop ecosystem. You mm -hmm. can run Spark on mm -hmm. uh, Amazon uh, Elastic Memory Reduce. Mm -hmm. So after you clean in the data, you sort the data and then you map the data to the, your um, uh, designated schema, you want to store them. Mm -hmm. So for transactional data, you can actually store into uh, a variety of databases, SQL, mm -hmm. non-SQL, uh, yes. offered by AWS, or you can just store them uh, on um, uh, Amazon Managed Apache Cassandra, which for designing for big data, and also mm -hmm. the good old S3 that's always you know, good for uh, data storage. Mm -hmm. And then with the data stored, you can do a lot of interesting things. You can do machine learning, yes. and after you train your model, you can package them to a, a mature um, inference API and package that through the API gateway, or you can simply connect all those databases mm -hmm. uh, to a service called AppSync yes. so that the application or the third party, they can query all, all those databases through a um, GraphQL. Yes. Um, or for traditional you know, data analytics or business intelligence, uh, you can use the uh, Athena or QuickSight to do query and uh, uh, visualization, or you can simply, uh, if you have already purchased your enterprise level business intelligence tool, mm -hmm. you can also connect to those databases or S3 bucket yes. uh, to build your own data warehouse uh, and then visualize them yes. um, to generate insight. Okay. Okay, um, so this is something that we do, uh, I believe, yes. There are many other AWS users that are um, not only using cloud, but also more specifically using the IoT services yes. offered by AWS. Can you yes. give us some more case sharing? 
Yeah, for sure. So actually, uh, today I'm going to introduce two um, uh, use case adopted by our cus um, successful customer uh, use case here. So actually, the very first one relates back to the smart building you just introduced. It's quite similar. So this customer is called uh, Entrata. So actually, Entrata they provides property management soft uh, software to uh, make life easier for the property companies organization. So actually, um, they used to struggle with um, connecting the IoT devices on the on the side of the buildings they really uh, they found that the connection was so unreliable and and uh, yeah. once upon a time the connection will lo will lose and they lose keep track of uh, they, they lose keep track uh, they lose track of the uh, the status of the IoT devices so with that uh, they were uh, they they were uh, they was deployed they was deploying it was IoT uh, message broker which is part of the uh, it was IoT core so that they could uh, securely um, allow the IoT devices to connect back to uh, their cloud platform so that um, all the data whatever they want they can filter the data they they would like to ingest to the backend um, AWS cloud platform, and also they are uh, they were relying on the uh, AWS IoT um, shadow of the AWS IoT core, so that it can keep track of the last latest uh, status of the IoT um, devices. So that whenever there's a new status change from their users, so actually they could reflect the status change in the backend system, or in uh, uh, or in, in reverse, they could actually allow the customer probability would uh, lock into the con uh, the console to actually send some remote action onto the on uh, onto the IoT devices on site as well. So this uh, present a pretty good examples for them to uh, quickly collect all the uh, the metadata coming from the IoT devices and also uh, they build some pretty um, beautiful dashboard like you do in the SEC platform, keeping uh, keeping uh, keep, uh, keeping track of all the IoT devices and also giving some visualized dashboards for the customer to see uh, or have the full visibility of their IoT devices and assets. Mm -hmm. Another example that I would like to uh, share is another company it's called Inel. So yeah, actually, it's a utility company. Yeah. Yes, it's another. It, it's also a utility utility company. And actually, they leverage their AWS IO, uh, They leverage AWS IoT Greengrass. So actually, um, to collect their remote size um, uh, smart meters metadata. So they deploy mm -hmm. over 500,000. Uh, uh, 500, um, they deploy the I IoT Greengrass into their over 500,000 cabins so that actually it can real time collect all those uh, smart meters or gadgets metadata and send it back to the, the cloud platform or even. Uh, they, they deploy some lambda function on uh, lambda function on the AWS IoT Greengrass so that it could act uh, on site upon uh, whenever there's a state change of the uh, IoT devices. So um, that it, uh, ultimately uh, help them to optimize the, the network uh, networks and also have a full visible uh, full vis visibility of their network consumption or usage and also the health status of their assets as well. Well, we, we could we uh, we feel we feel excited here that they draw they they managed to drive down their overall uh, overall cost of maintaining that system uh, by twenty percent in that successful case. Mm -hmm. Well, wow. okay, I think that's all for the cash sharing. Now uh, we're in the Q and A session. Uh, I'm gonna take questions uh, from the audience. Um, I think the first one where we're waiting for the question to come in is that. Mm -hmm. I think at the early day of the webinar, you introduced uh, MQTT. Yes. Um, it sounds like MQTT is much better than HTTP. Can you yes. uh, explain to the audience what's the difference between the two? Well, sure. Well, uh, really depends on, uh, it really depends on the use case in terms of which one is better than the other. So uh, actually MQTT, like uh, what I uh, just mentioned, it stands for uh, message queuing transport, uh, transportation. So um, it's widely used in IoT uh, business settings. So actually uh, one of the benefits provided by MQTT is that it's a much lightweight protocol, as I said, uh, meaning that from a technical standpoint of view, the header uh, of the payload is much uh, lightweight compared with the HTTP so that makes it uh, uh, super suitable for, uh, especially for you, uh, especially for cases like you have a lot of IoT devices deployed on site, and there are a lot of connection that you need to establish with the backend systems. Mm -hmm. Actually, because it's more lightweight and it um, it has lower requirements onto the IoT devices as well. So uh, that's one sense. The other benefit is that it's much faster um, uh, in terms of the throughput compared with the HTTP because uh, according to the 
measurement benchmark provided by 3G networks. The overall throughput, uh, on average speaking, um, for MQTT is 90, is 90 times faster than the H, uh, HTTP that could provide. And also for MQTT actually, um, is a published and a subscribe based protocol, yeah. uh, which is different from the HTTP because for HTTP, you really need to, um, the overhead of maintaining con uh, the connection of HTTP is quite heavy, but in a pub sub based protocol. So actually, uh, even when, um, the network is intermittent or once in a while, the connection is down. So actually, um, when the connection goes up again, so actually the IOT device, it can still consume the data sent from the other end via the message broker or still continue to send the data the, the data bit to the backend cloud system. So that makes it a very robust one, uh, especially in the IoT environment. Um, okay, some uh, audience asked, uh, what communication technology will the AWS IoT device can adopt, such mm -hmm. as LoRa and BIoT? Mm -hmm. um, I think our common practice is that you can um, actually normally use a gateway at the edge um, mm -hmm. so that either it can be uh, a, a small server or edge device that can convert the LoRa and BIoT to um, either MQTT or HTTP so that it can communicate to the cloud. Mm -hmm. uh, or um, maybe then say you can answer from your perspective. Yeah, I actually uh, totally agree with you. And actually, uh, like uh, your on the SE, SEC platform, you place the IoT green grounds to do the transfer uh, to do the the protocol conversions. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a pretty effective way of doing that because um, some uh, in some in some settings, so actually, customers are managing a very uh, a large number of IoT devices instead of letting the IoT device connect it one by one to the backend system. Be it, uh, of course, you can do it uh, via the three G networks, right? Yeah. Um, that that is definitely a very common way of doing that. But uh, in some cases, if your customer uh, if your IoT device is running some legacy protocol, then IoT Green Cross um, should be a, 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 a should be a preferred option for you to do the protocol conversion and also add some uh, capabilities onto the edge gateway as well. Okay, uh, in the interest of time, we're gonna take one more question. Mm -hmm. Some people are asking about uh, security and data privacy. Yes. Uh, I think, yeah, that's the most common questions also I encountered mm -hmm. when people are adopting mm -hmm. IoT. Mm -hmm. So uh, can you do some, what, have the, what kind of measure does AWS take mm -hmm. to ensure uh, IoT security? Well, uh, talking of, talking of uh, cloud security, so actually cloud security is a top priority of AWS here. And our, cu our customer benefits from the, the network and also the, uh, the cloud infrastructure uh, that is built to meet the highest standards of, of some of the most security sensitive organization in the world. And actually security is a shared responsibility uh, between AWS and uh, our customers. Um, we also mentioned about the security of the cloud. Uh, and security in the cloud. So like security of the cloud, that means customer, um, AWS will be responsible for the safety of the infrastructure that runs uh, your cloud service. And but, uh, but secondly, for the security in the cloud, so that means our customer also um, need to pay attention to the data or the network security um, with which they run their application or workloads onto the clouds. So let me, uh, let me give you some example, especially for, um, we are talking about IoT, right? Mm -hmm. Because uh, like in AWS IoTs, you can leverage, um, you can leverage uh, through a slew of different useful features provided by AWS IoT to uh, safeguard your security. Like uh, we provide the IAM identity, identity SS management, sort of like a role-based SS control uh, mechanism, allowing yeah. you um, which role will be allowed to do what kind of action, right? Or uh, in IoT Excel, we provide IoT Defender, uh, which allow you to establish the audit auditing roof so that you can uh, detect any deviation, uh, security deviation, best practice deviation from your environment, and also give you some suggestion to mitigate the risk. And of course, um, we also have some other uh, features like the data at risk encryption. Um, after you ingest your data, definitely you can choose the um, KMS, what we call the key management service, so that you can encrypt your data at rest yeah, as well. Yeah. So those are some of the examples that um, we offer our customer, um, some of the examples of the features that we offer our customer to safeguard their IoT yeah. platform or their workloads. Uh, but I believe that like the, um, uh, I believe SEC or actually you are playing in the industri uh, utility industry. 
you must have a lot of compliance. Uh, compliance yes, right? um, actually, yeah, technology is one thing. Yes, the, the, there are a lot of uh, technology that can secure environment, uh, yes. but also more importantly is your people, your process. Yes, you have to establish the right process and also train the people mm -hmm. uh, to how to leverage this technology and how to properly use them to keep your environment secure. Like you said, it's a um, mm -hmm. dual responsibility, not only yes. the technology, but also yes. uh, the people are using those technology. Um, so I think in the interest of time, we're going to end the Q&A here today. Um, the next, uh, I'm going to do some advertising here. So this will be the end of today's webinar. Our next webinar will be on August 5th. And the focus area will be on building. And the topic is optimizing your HVAC system. We also have a whole series of webinars lined up through August and September. Uh, and also, we're also hosting our SEC symposium will be hosted on October 9th. So if you want to know more about the event and the latest update, please kindly follow in our LinkedIn website. And of course, we're going to update all the information about the webinar on our LinkedIn. And also, if you want to know more about SEC or about CLP and product, please follow our YouTube channel. And that will be the end of today's webinar. And thank you very much. And thank you, Benson. Yeah, thank you, Dee. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe, everyone. Yeah, goodbye. Goodbye.